Welcome to Debt to Cinema. I'm Brian Gillis. And I'm Stephen Maltman X. Like most people, we love going to the theater and catching latest releases. However, you can sadly put a big dent in your wallet. Fortunately, living in the digital age makes the viewing possibilities endless from the comforts of home. Many of these films that you can see right from your couch, we're ashamed to say we miss, despite labeling ourselves cinephiles. So join us as one or both of us cross off a title from our list of shame. It can be an all-time essential classic. Or an underrated piece of cinema that's worth giving a shot. Hell. It might just be some trashy film we want the other's opinion on. So sit tight and join us as we pay off our debts, one dollar at a time. Esta es un buen película para primer uh, season de Halloween, no? I don't speak a lick of Spanish. That is the worst Ron Perlman. I, and I don't know. I think it came out as like a Texas accent of some it's, sort. It's a good movie to start Halloween with, or October, or our season of The Witch, sure. or whatever you want to call it. When um, is Day of the Dead? I mean, did we miss an opportunity there? Day of the Dead is a day after Halloween. It's November 1st. Which makes more sense because Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve as it's actually known, the idea of it is pretty synonymous with Day of the Dead, despite the cultures being so, you know, vastly different. The idea is, you know, All Hallows' Eve, um, is that the earthly realm and the spiritual realm are the closest to one another. That they truly are um, not separated as they always are. And so in Hispanic culture, more, you know, naturally Mexican culture, mm -hmm. Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos, um, is this idea that the dead are around us. They that you're if you're walking the streets that you could very much so pass by one of your ancestors, etc. And that's what Halloween kinda is supposed to be too, even though it's been truly Americanized and commoditized. Um, but no, that's not what this movie is at no, all. It no. Is nothing I mean, about it, that. I don't think you would put on a costume of Jesus Greece, but uh maybe. Yeah, you, you know maybe. what? Hey, if uh, anyone can be Ron Perlman, like pull off uh, being a look alike, you should be this character, totally. I mean you're going to use the name Jesus Greece. Why not also use his name, Angel de la Guardia? Yeah. Guardian Angel and Grey Jesus. <laughs> Just, you know, great names of personified characters right yep, there. Absolutely. That's how you know this is Guillermo del Toro's first film. Just in the naming structure. Just just that alone. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of it's it, funny because it, not that's much always has been changed. true. I mean, just. <laughs> I, I don't know, like, uh, there, there's interesting, uh, just because, I don't know, I keep defaulting to Pacific Rim, but just the names that he chooses, mm. like... Uh, Always, yeah. I think Stacker Pentecost is, uh, that's a fun one. It's like, what are the names in Crimson Peak? I don't even remember. I, it's I like... don't remember. It's been two years, you know. Uh, I remember Fuck, I really liked yeah. the movie, but yeah, like, yeah, I, I not, like it no one talks about it. Well, no one really talks about any of his movies, to be honest. Until they come up in Labyrinth. conversation, yeah. No, it's it's really Pan's Labyrinth or Hellboy Two. Those are his two movies. Like he, you know, he's done lots of other stuff. He's he's I like done Blade this. Two he's, better, honestly. Yeah, but, Blade Two is a great yeah. movie. He did the first Hellboy, Pacific Rim, Crimson Peak. He's got the the Shape, Shape of, of Water, Water this which year. Looks awesome. He's done a lot. He's done TV. He's directed up well some of uh, episode of The Simpsons, that Troll Hunter show they did on Netflix. He directed yeah. like two episodes of that. Like he truly has done yeah. quite a lot he also mm -hmm. has quite a hand in dreamworks animation like serving as a producer mm -hmm. there you know um he's been a con story consultant or at least made suggestions on a lot of those movies too so yeah he gets around it's funny even though that this is you know his quote, quote unquote first feature film that at the time of its making he was basically running you know a creature shop like he i, <laughs> I forget the name of it right now uh, but for 15 years, like he did designs and and creatures and makeup mostly in Mexico, but even in America. And it was his own shop that did this film, and it shows in this Chronos machine, in this kick-ass like gold insect clock that gives you vampire powers or whatever you want to call it. Like just the way that this film sets up with that like five minutes of the history of this this clockmaker or whatever and oh he made this device and and just how weird is like oh 400 years later he was stabbed through the heart and he had skin of marble and and just how he kind of recreates this uh vampire mythos 
and then he would also recreate it again in Blade Two, and then you know they kind of somewhat, play a role yeah. somewhat in in Hellboy as well, or maybe possibly Crimson Peak, depending on how you read that film. Well, here it is or, much more in the classical sense. Like this is mm-hmm. sort of a vampire monster movie that plays. Very much in the same way that uh, the classic uh, Universal Bela Lugosi Dracula flick does. You know, it's it's that same thing where it's very slow and it's very atmospheric and mainly focused on plot. You know, there's no ver- there's no rich characterizations. It's just you kind of take in no, this world yeah. and the mood and no the atmosphere. Scares. Yeah, no but, monsters. Yeah, I mean, the characters you, might be monsters, but there's there's no it's very true moody. terror here. Yeah, and mm-hmm. you mix that with body horror too, which. Uh, not quite the fly level, but given the resources of this, still pretty incredible. It's like, yeah, it it was yeah. very cringeworthy near the end. Uh, uh, for one specific thing, that was just like, oh, that you went there. That is disgusting. Like this very Videodrome esque when he sticks his hand. Very much his so. Stomach. That was the one where it was like, mm-hmm. okay, now you grossed me out. Like I thought you were you were fine. As in, like, yeah, you're you're doing good. You're making an effort. Oh, dude, you straight up just shocked me and made me feel uncomfortable. Bra fucking Vogue for a fucking de- debut, like, at this level? Yeah, bravo. You know, I listed off all these Guillermo del Toro films. I didn't list all of them. You know, I, I've seen them all now. This was the final one I had to see. I, I've seen Mimic. That, that was the first one I saw. I've seen The Devil's Backbone. Like, he has an oeuvre. He is an auteur. Like, he is an author. He writes most of his films. He does the designs himself. Like, you know, he had that um, that museum... Uh, art installation that I, I wish I had gone to. Yeah, LACMA, yeah. but then it moved and moved and moved. I think it's going to be in Mexico soon now. I don't know. I don't really use Twitter, so it's hard for me to keep tabs. <laughs> but things that are present here are present in all of his works. I mean, he is known to have either a very naive character at the center of the film, look at Hellboy or Crimson Peak or even Pacific Rim, or even better than that, an actual naive character in a child, which is also here it's in devil's backbone it's in Patton's labyrinth in all of his films you have this just sense of uh wonder not just in terms of the world that you're being introduced to but also the fact that the character that is being introduced to it your vessel you know the the pe- the person that is actually guiding us as an audience whose eyes we're seeing through is also full of wonder i'm not so sure the child is really that effective because she's not exactly that person. She's here. not like, even. She, no, he, she's not he, even the character. It's yeah, no, like, but Jesus like Greece is, it is also, one of those things, though. Like just mm-hmm. that element where I was thinking, like, okay, this is there's a little girl, you know, Del Toro and little girls. This is probably gonna be like his main uh, focal point, but no, no, it wasn't. I mean, I I don't know what it is with him and like putting little girls. Like even Pacific Rim had that one flashback moment where it was like, yeah. yep, I can tell that's a Del Toro touch holding that well, one even, shoe, yeah. But, Even after she's a little girl in that, she's still a little girl. You know, it's Idris Elba's daughter. You know, she can't yeah. do anything without him type of thing. And in Hellboy, it's the same thing. Like, Hellboy is this little boy. He he is his father's son, whichever father you want to look at. And he's, he's a child, you know. Um, like, And from all intents and purposes, like, as far as I can tell, as anyone will tell you, like, Guillermo del Toro himself is also like that. Like, he's full of wonder. He's one of those people that gets googly-eyed and full mm-hmm. of joy and just wants to know everything about everything. Yeah. Um, no, and, he's a and very could... enthusiastic, passionate guy. Like, the, a guy that you kind of wish you were more like. Mm-hmm. And you could read this film, like I said, in terms of what you just said about the girl being the focal point, but she's not. Like, Ar- yeah. Aurora, she only has one line of dialogue, and it's Grandpa. She says, Abuelo. Like, yeah, that no, is I mean, it. what I'm referencing is, like, it's mainly the fact that this movie that, like, it, it's kind of, it, it's not necessarily a down note because this is a debut, but it was one of those things where I figured, knowing Del Toro's other films, that would be more important. But, no, she's just there. She's just a granddaughter. Her character is about that important for being a granddaughter that she literally says grandpa oh she's she's a plot device mostly and, yeah you know, that's the she, thing what what she does does move the story along more than probably mm-hmm. anyone else um besides you know the the uncle here um the, the antagonist or the whatever you want to say he is the the not mime the foil um but jesus greece is also a child you you have maybe he runs an antique shop like he's clearly obsessed with things that are old but one of the first things that you see him doing in this film is playing hopscotch in his store mm-hmm. with his granddaughter. You see that twice. You know, you see him, especially in being reborn as a vampire or an immortal or a marble skin or whatever you want to call it. When you have that sequence when he um, when he first uses the device and his, his 
his wife Mercedes like you know patches him up and he's sitting there in the fridge and he's drinking that pitcher of water and he's just like oh man like this thirst is insatiable I'm so thirsty I'm so thirsty he looks at that meat with all the blood and you can just see him like lapping at it like oh I want that he doesn't even know what it is yet he doesn't know that he needs it because he's a vampire but he knows that it's important and that just continues throughout like the the hijinks that he gets thrown into these little like silly moments where it's like you're not laughing but you know it's not necessarily it's, it's whimsical, definitely but no it is amusing it, it's, it's deliberately funny yeah comical is mm-hmm. the best way to put it like it is it, it's irony at its highest level it's this guy can't die he is immortal but look his car fell off this edge that <laughs> he got stabbed that he almost got cremated that he just got his forehead stapled together like all of these things that keep on happening to him um if we did intro still, I would probably say this there, and maybe I can make one. I don't know. That's but up to you. This, this film is not the same in terms of like uh, El Secreto de Sus Ojos, but I was aware of it at the exact same moment from the same exact class. Not in the same like lesson or anything, but we had this uh, project where we took a film from uh, Latin American filmmakers, you know, filmography yeah and we, and all we had, had to, to watch it at the yeah end do of the semester. presentation yeah i did that yeah all I, that stuff i did mine on city of god uh, good choice um I, i'm happy i own that one dvd but <laughs> so someone did it on this you know i was fairly familiar with Guillermo del toro i hadn't seen all of his works yet as i have now i hadn't even heard of this one you know this is before criterion put it out this is before it got its uh you it's know, it's new, in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Before it, before they touched up the print and had a new run, you know, and before it looks beautiful. Oh, it really does. And someone, you know, did a presentation on this, and they presented it as, oh yeah, it's Guillermo del Toro, and it, it's a vampire movie. And I was like, oh, I'm so intrigued. And then they showed the sequence at the the New Year's Eve party where he's, <laughs> you know, stalking the guy with the nosebleed. And I knew then that I was going to see it at some point. I think that I tried is a good maybe. One, yeah. Maybe a year or two ago, I, I found a copy I was watching. It was just, like, bad quality, or maybe I was tired. Because this definitely is one of those kinds of films where you have to be in the mood. You want, you need to want to watch something heady. And it's not because it has subtitles, but just in terms of this um, almost cerebral nature of it, that you are relearning about well, what a vampire is. It's also, it's just, it's very slow and deliberately gothic. It's very moody and atmospheric, and it is mm-hmm. like... You know, uh, for the sake of a universal monster movie that we watched earlier this year, it is like The Mummy, where, you know, those are the kind of dialogue sequences that you get, their exposition, they're learning basically the rules of this world, what's going to happen, and you're just taking in this world and basically the creepy, eerie vibe that it's setting up. And it's that kind of yeah. enjoyment, that simplicity that Del Toro was able to get, uh, which really, I mean, you know, it's on a script level, it is, it is just that, and... <laughs> I, I don't know. It's like there's definitely moments of like I don't I don't think it's necessarily that cringe inducing. The English stuff here though, it's like it it's supposed to be bad. Yeah, I, I, guess. I was reading. There's like the only funny trivia thing that I read about this film is that well, first Ron Perlman's character was supposed to know Spanish, but it's Ron Perlman. He doesn't. So know he's Spanish. not. Yeah. No, it's funnier yeah. if he and speaks English. He's yeah, just the one so, guy that's like, I mm-hmm. just want I just want my plastic surgeries listening to. I his just want tapes a fucking are, nose. Okay. Yeah. Which makes sense because, like, his like the first thing that stood out to me in this movie was like how bad his fucking nose looked. And I was like, that's not his real nose. But yeah, I mean, it's oh, a just how nose, comical though bad. he gets at the end when he's like, "Yes, mm-hmm. it's all mine, it's all mine." But um, uh, just this movie's worth it alone for Ron Perlman. Perlman was supposed to, you know, no Spanish. This this is a Mexican production, Mexican mm-hmm. actors. One of the biggest budgeted films in Mexico at the time it was like 1.5 million, but it it ballooned up to two million because all practical, all everything. Mm-hmm. He couldn't do the Spanish. The line reading just sounded like shit. And so Guillermo del Toro like, made adjustments to the script, and he basically took the only American characters here, the De La Guardia family, the, these guardians of the secrets of the lad and documents on the Kronos machine, and made them like intentionally over-the-top, stereotypical villains. And like his reasoning for this is brilliant. It's because, and you could look like 100 rifles perhaps, that in any film that there's Mexican characters in Hollywood, they are over the top and not realistic. And he was like, I'm going to do the, the, the same thing, but with the white people. 
it makes sense. Like, these are cartoon villains. Like, this is fucking, like, Gargamel or something. Like, these are people that you just... It's like, what what's going on? Like, he has the canes, the way he's walking, like, putting on the stuff, like, the intercom stuff. Like, all everything about that, the way that... These these two white characters are set up. You're like, yeah, there's something weird here. Well, they do have legitimate, I, I like, don't... cool, sinister lines. Like, I do love that little touch of, like, just remember, we're open all night. Come on by if you want to give us what we want. Like, that works, you know. That's... I got the rules. Yeah, that is that is a good line, even if uh, they're hammy. But, yeah, I, I guess that makes more sense now, you know. But, like, I, Pearlman usually is a joy to watch just to watch him chew up the scenery that's one of the best things about him in pacific rim you know he's just eating everything up and just having fun and here it's it's even better than that you know we'll see how much fun it is next week or whatever um <laughs> but this is right at the beginning of his career i think he did like one or two other movies maybe he was on stage for a, a little bit i'm sure he mm-hmm. did some tv but this could have been the thing that made him a star as far as we know or maybe it's it's the pick for next week as well I mean, has but, he ever really been a star? Like n- next yeah, Hellboy. Yeah, I, 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 no, like aside from that, but that's again from Del Toro. The, and he's he's got an Amazon TV show that's pretty successful. He has a Crackle show now. Like he's a full on star now. Sons of Anarchy made him a star. Like he he truly is a star star. Like he just did a Reddit AMA, and what he said in it himself is that it's his third. So he's big on the internet. Like he's not just like a cult star because of films like these. Well, he uh, seems but, that's what he kind of seems like to me. Is like he's one of those guys along with maybe Nathan Fillion, where you know he might be recognized mm-hmm. by other people but is mainly known for a bit more of the geekier stuff that they well, do i think he's crossed over from being a character actor to a full-on star like he's not a list no but he's cult a yeah. list he truly is like he's one of those people if you go to comic-con and you see him you freak the fuck out yeah more no, so people would be like it's would, hellboy like, and they want to get a picture yeah exactly like more which, so again than you know McGuire same deal with uh nathan fillion you know like it's it's in that kind of league well, i think if the, you have to categorize is... it Nathan Fillion's never really done anything but TV. You know, he's done, uh, not Bones, but uh, Castle. He, he did Firefly. He did, you know, I mean, sure, Firefly got a movie. You got Serenity. But he's a TV guy. He's not big time. He's not in big movies. He's not in, in cult films. He's a TV first actor. It sucks. You know, he'd be great in the Uncharted movie as Nathan Drake if that ever happened. But it won't mm-hmm. happen because Sony casted, you know, Tom Holland as young Nathan Drake. Um <laughs> Yeah, go Sony. But, yeah, like, just in terms of the Guillermo del Toro collaborations alone, like, it's more than just, oh, yeah, like, he's that guy that's in some movies. Like, he has name recognition. He has a great handle, permutations. Like, he truly is a star, even if he doesn't have star dumb. Like, you know, he's not going to run a red carpet. He's not going to, uh, to to really, you know, get the, the pictures on the front of the magazines. But apparently he wants to run for president, and he's just one of those people that, like, maybe that could fucking work. Like, 2020, if Kanye's going to do it and he does it, like, who else is going to do it? Like, uh, But back to this movie, I, 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 I still don't quite know what to think about it. I just watched it. I like the tones. Like you said, it is very gothic. Like, that mm-hmm. is... It set the tone for his career, truly. There's a reason why this was made, and then just, you know, like, two, three years later, he made Mimic. I don't want to rewatch Mimic. That fucking kind of terrified me as a kid it is a scary (laughs) film it is about this super smart cockroach that can pass for a human and then he starts killing people and it's spooky it truly is spooky um like not unlike anything else or unlike anything else that i think aaron toro's ever done because it's not gothic it's not quote-unquote horror it's not suspense like it truly is a horror film like it is horrifying there is a big bad he is killing people there are jump scares there is unsettling imagery like that was him making a true true creature feature and just taking what he made here and running with it because they tried universal like bought the rights to this film they tried to make a remake and he like laughingly like told them who wants to see jack lemon licking blood off the floor <laughs> yeah. And it's like they actually bought it, it or they tried to buy it. No, they well, they bought the company that owned the distribution rights in America. And then Mm -hmm. therefore they kind of own the rights and they were going to make a remake. And maybe they still will. Who said maybe someone will because it's universal. And it's like you said, this is kind of like a universal feature, like a a monster film. Well, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think especially now studios have a better grip on how to sell horror and how to mm -hmm. handle it. Right. Like as far as how to treat it, as far as getting the creative talent involved. But 
Lionsgate this month has Boo 2, well, Blum depending House. on when people listen, but Boo 2, Medea Halloween, That's and That's a Tyler Jigsaw. Perry production, come on. They also got Jigsaw, though, so. Oh, that logo. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, like, it, I, this was also just something I was in the perfect mood for at the time, but it's really just the simplicity of it, just taking taking the mood in like you know there really isn't much here aside from the fact that del toro is a lot of uh one of those filmmakers that people just love and if you have not seen this you know like just a small film that he can make without having unlimited resources where he can fully realize his vision like you know the production value is still really good but it's oh yeah it's stuff that they have to they got to play with their surroundings and like you know just the the way that the set is for uh uh for the uncle for or for De La Guardia. Um, yeah, just, you know, the little statues that are set up there, like how that's, that's not like purely like a set straight out of Del Toro's mind, but that's like, the, it's like a collage of like things that he's able to take and build his imagination with. And you can really just see him like getting his start and like fully getting his vision out there and uh, just how he's growing as a filmmaker, like with what he has here. But like, yeah, just it, it's, it's funny just seeing how his imagination at play, like with, the resources he's got you know instead of getting unlimited studio money and going for that it's so funny to consider the fact that del toro is not in like really acclaimed in the realm of like early 90s filmmakers especially independent filmmakers uh despite this film coming out like 92 93 like that's the same time frame of but Reservoir Dogs got... and clerks and slacker and all of these other films by all of these filmmakers Maybe because they're American that are well, heralded I think also as he's like just got gods of films. cinema. I think he's just got two films in the '90s though that came out. Right, there was this, and then Mick Max, and then uh, or no, no Mimic, 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 sorry, Mick Max, different director. Yeah, different, but, different guy. We'll talk and, about him next week. Different, um, different decade too. But also, um, I mean, Mimic. You know, I know that on Blu-ray now it's the director's cut, and I know that there was production issues or. I don't know if he fully got his say because, you know, he was coming to America and he was making a studio movie and he wasn't the Del Toro that we have now where he has a bit more of a say in what happens. But he was still making independent film on our continent, acclaimed independent film as a writer, director and like creature shop maker. You know, this is something that is still very much so like the films that he makes now. He has a vision. He's not sure. And perhaps it's because it was in different language, because it didn't get a wide release here. But even still, like, maybe that's at fault of the Sundance Institute or IFC or whomever that all of these white men who made these films either out of college or out of high school, and not all of them were white men, I mean, look at Robert Rodriguez, that were able to get something at Miramax or get something here or there and get it into the art house, when this is very much so an art house film, that it has a story that would very much still play today, that this is a film that could be made now, at a budget very similar to this one. The difference is that, you know, it would be digital instead, and therefore it would cost maybe half as much as this one did. I mean, the, the, this movie's pretty extravagant, too, just based on the yeah. sets alone, especially at it's that level. It's not an amateur film. This is not no. a filmmaker who, you know, got better with age. This is not someone who didn't know what he was doing and got a break later down the road. No, this is someone with the specific love of a certain type of movie yes. that wanted to make his own, and he managed he to. He still makes those films. Yeah. That they might not get the acclaim that they deserve, you know, like Crimson Peak, but he's still making them. Like, Shape of Water seems like, just based on the trailer I've seen and when we would talk about it on Two Cents, seems like it's going to be like a really interesting love story, you know, an interspecies love story. It's going to be gothic and moody, I'm sure, but in the way that Crimson Peak was labeled as like a horror film, like a, a monster house or haunted house film, and just flop because people expected something very scary, yeah, this one is not being shown. It's going to be like a Hitchcock gothic thriller. Yeah. Like yeah. it, like an interesting like Rebecca Redux, whereas yeah. Shape of Water seems like it's you know some kind of like Twilight Zone type thing, and that's what he wants to do. Like I'm sure he would love I, his passion project is the Haunted Mansion. That's what he really 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 wants to do, but he also has uh you know the the scary stories we tell in the dark or whatever. He wants to do something like the Twilight Zone. He doesn't want to scare people as much as he wants to show them something scary isn't actually frightening. Like, his his whole idea is that 
fantasy is both spooky and it can be cute and it can be endearing that you know just like we started the episode with in terms of you know what halloween is what dia de los muertos is that it is not about monsters it is about there are monsters around us always it's just at some point of the year and it happens to be at the time of of our recording right now people are more in tune more in touch with those things that when you're walking down the street and you see a black cat as this time of the year especially that you might get scared i will point out that i do have a new cat he is a kitten and he is black and for half this episode he was sitting on my lap and the other half he was running around my room making a mess i know that i have to keep him indoors i already do that but this month especially because people might want to skin him or fuck with him or maybe kill him you know and it's because of this just concept that you know they are bad or uh, unlucky or witches have them or just or, the very whatever. very superstitious people out there yeah out. i get you and yeah. it's, it's not even like superstitious people like most of america most of the world is that way like the bible it talks about witches and how evil they are mm-hmm. you know i just I, I know you saw it in theaters but i just saw the witch on uh, amazon prime i saw that that is not some fucking fantasy you know it's labeled <laughs> a new england folktale that's a real thing. That's a living document of what things happened back then in our country's history. That is a real thing. 400 years ago, that shit actually happened. As a country, we're not too far removed from that concept. Mm-hmm. And Del Toro makes things with this film and everything he's made since then that just try to prove to you that what you don't know doesn't mean is scary. And just because something's scary doesn't mean that it's bad. That it's just part of life that you may not want to accept. And that's why, you know, there's cockroaches here, there's cockroaches in Mimic, there's cockroaches in, like, most of what he does. Because they're just insects that run around, and hey, if you look at this film the way that it wants you to look at it, they're immortal creatures, maybe they're gods. You know, like, there's, like, these interesting little concepts that are here or there. Just that line is pretty, in- is mm-hmm. enough good food for thought of maybe the insects were God's favorite creatures. It's like mosquitoes walk on water. Ants and cockroaches are can be resurrected. Like maybe they were Jesus, Jesus. Uh, I I I can't buy this one, despite how interesting it is and uh, the just the creature feature aspect of it and the just a lot of things going on. It, it is a silver dollar, though. I I think it yeah. it really paints the scene for everything that he's done since that you know from the get go, which is pretty rare with a filmmaker that they knew what they were doing. You know, sometimes it's hit or miss. Maybe something like Tarantino where he stole everything from someone else. But this one is truly him. This is not an, a, a quote-unquote original story. You know, it's a Dracula. It's a vampire story. It's definitely story. taken, yeah, from that. And but like also it's uh, the fly comes to mind, especially mm-hmm. with the body horror aspect. But It's yeah, taking serious, serious creative liberties. It is reinventing something as himself. And like I said... He got a chance about 15 years later to do it with Blade 2. All right, not even 15 years, 10 years. It was like, like 10, exactly yeah. 10 years later. Nine to 10 years, yeah. And he made Blade 2, which like totally reinvented the Blade franchise. Like what they did with the. I have that on DVD. I got to rewatch it. Um, but yeah, this, this one's a silver dollar. I, I think it's a, a very interesting flick. If you have Filmstruck, check it out as a Criterion release. Uh, I can't go as so far as to say next time Barnes & Noble or Criterion has a, a sale to pick this one up for $20. Um, but wa- worth a watch, especially this month. No, I, th- I think it's a very solid silver dollar, and it really is just like, if you're in for just that mood or that atmosphere and just something very simplistic, mm-hmm. then, uh, yeah, g- by all means, go nuts. You know, there are people that would buy this, that would definitely be up for oh, that. Oh, sure. Um, especially th- as fans. Yeah, I mean, this is not up my alley for that. I don't know how often I would watch this, but I would definitely be open to checking this out again. Um, uh, but yeah, no, just th- that really, it, there's so little to say about it. I just, I think uh, the biggest highlight for me, Ron Perlman, which, uh, you know, I guess if this is the unofficial Halloween Ron Perlman month, then that's, you know, that's a good thing to get out of this, right? Yeah. Uh- it's good for me. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen to more by checking out the Dollar Review Show, where we cover theatrical and streaming releases, as well as give our two cents on anything we sought out on our own, whether that be TV, music, etc. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. And we're also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, just about anywhere on the internet with hours of content available to you for free. 
But for those of you that feel that the show is worth your dollar, you can send us a donation at patreon.com slash dollar reviews. Contributions not only earn our undying love, but they also make it possible for us to improve our recording equipment and to give you the highest quality episodes possible. But more importantly, they'd be helping us acquire the content to review. You know, trips to the multiplex are expensive, and the more donations we receive, the more films we can review for your listening pleasure. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a death to cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis. That's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S. And now you know how to spell the email, too. And also under the same name on the Love You site, Letterboxd, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films that I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at Letterbox under the same name where I log everything I watch and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change.